Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages Florida podcast. In this show we talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs and interesting folks who live here in the villages, to give perspectives of what is happening here in the Villages Florida. We hope to add a new episode most Fridays at 9 a.m. We are a listener-supported podcast. There will be shout-outs for supporters in episodes. As a supporter, you will get a direct email link to Mike. In Season 5, we are making significant improvements and changes on an ongoing basis. How can you support our podcast? This is Mike Roth, and listeners, I'm thrilled to share with you this podcast, which is my passion project for you. This podcast brings me joy, brings you knowledge, inspiration, and a lot of things that people need to know about the villages and the people that are living here and what's actually going on. Creating this podcast is a labor of love, even though it demands more time than I can easily spare. But hey, Time isn't something we can buy back, right? Now, here's where you come in. The unsung heroes and heroines. You can help us keep the podcast alive and thriving. How? By becoming a supporter. There are two simple ways that you can support us. The first is a small monthly donation. Visit our podcast website, openforuminthevillagesflorida.com and click on the black supporter box. Even a small $3 to $10 a month donation makes a difference. And guess what? You can cancel any time, no strings attached. The second way that you can contribute to the podcast is by making a purchase of an Amazon product at Amazon standard prices, and we are paid a small commission on each purchase as an Amazon affiliate. That way there's no extra money out of your pocket, but you are supporting the podcast. Check every week because we're going to be adding new Amazon products that you can buy and support the podcast with. Thank you. And your support means the world to us. Stay curious, stay inspired, and keep those headphones on. If you have a book that you would like to turn into an audiobook, let us know via email to mike at rothvoice.com. Hope you enjoy today's show. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages. I'm here today with Peter Bernard. Peter, thanks for joining us. Certainly. Good to be here. Peter, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Well, I grew up in Laguna Beach, California. My father worked at NBC in Burbank. He was the musical director of Laugh-In all the years that it was on. And so I got the bug for television. Mm -hmm. So I struck out on my own and visited a whole bunch of stations, TV stations in the West Coast. And I finally got a job in Pocatello, Idaho. And the rest is history. (laughs) (laughs) Pocatello, Idaho. Yeah. I looked. I did stories about potatoes. <laughs> no, I did some. <laughs> There's a great commercial. I think it was a Super Bowl commercial about the potato beach. Mm-hmm. Couch potato beach. I saw that. Yeah. It's kind of odd looking. <laughs> it was very odd. Yeah. One of the best, the best things about Super Bowl was always the commercials. Right on. Okay. So, Peter, why don't you tell our listeners about what your opinion is of the current state of media in America? Well, I come from an interesting perspective because I've been a TV reporter for 40 years. I retired in 2020, just before COVID went crazy. My opinion is that it's not like the good old days. When I was learning how to be a journalist, we were always told to be unbiased and to not state your opinions on television. Mm -hmm. With the advent of cable TV and the advent of MSNBC and Fox and OAN and Newsmax, you name it, what's going on in cable TV kind of is embarrassing to me in that when you report the news, you're not supposed to interject what you think about it. Unfortunately, the CNNs of the world, the MSNBCs, they have decided to throw that rule book out the window. So there are too many people, in my opinion, that are on television that are not really good, solid journalists. And, you know, you could, you, I know the names are going through your mind right now, but those guys, in my opinion, are not TV news journalists. They are personalities, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, the Rachel Maddow's of the world. So I think generally we have got a fractured society, and I blame it on the media infrastructure that we have right now. I remember growing up and watching Walter Cronkite. Mm-hmm. and he, he was quite a guy. Yeah. I, I got to meet him one time. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I had sold CBS in, in Manhattan, mm-hmm. a very large set of computer disks and <laughs> disk drives when they were, they, they were quite a thing. And mm-hmm. one day I was up in the offices and I'm walking through and I was in front of Walter Cronkite's office. So I walked in and said hi to him. Nice. 
Nice. Yeah. Well, I think he would roll over in his grave if he saw what was going on now. Oh, yeah. Huntley and Brinkley. They... Huntley and Brinkley. I love those guys. So I grew up watching that. I still like Lester Holt and um, the lady on CBS whose name's escaping me right now. I think generally people like that are doing a fairly good job of st- trying to remain unbiased. But when I tune past the cable channels, I, c- I can't even watch it anymore. It's not television news. Right. Well, it's it's not even-handed. No, no. And when some of them just make up stories, that's really terrible. Well, it's terrible. I don't want to pick on Fox, but you remember they were recently told to pay $878 million for falsifying information about one of the Dominion's uh, voting machines. Mm. Well, to me, that was a stake in the heart for them. I'm sure there are other broadcasters out there who have made up things and they haven't been caught. Hopefully they will. But it's disturbing to me when I see that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if you know a lot about computers, you know that most systems can be hacked. Yep. Okay. And, you know, whether or not Dominion is 100% clean is... We may never know. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. We'll never know unless there's a tremendous breach Mm -hmm. and someone releases code. Right. And then the hackers will take it apart and tell us whether it's uh, real or not. I'd like to get back to the day when you just tell the story. You know, Fox's slogan is, we report, you decide. I'd like to see that again. Mm Mm-hmm. I'd like to see some honesty in the news, and I really liked that there was always a, a FCC requirement to present one side of the story and then the other side of the yeah, story. Yeah, that was called the fairness doctrine. That, that fairness doctrine, we, I was very sad to see that go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes and no on that. I don't like government intervention in private affairs. I would like to think that the networks would do the right thing because that's what they're supposed to do. So to have the government come in and say, you need to do this, as a broadcaster, former broadcaster, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a difference between public airwaves, radio and television in the traditional sense, and news that's delivered via the internet, mm-hmm. which is, in quotation marks, a private carrier. Agreed. But we'll never fix that here. No. Why don't you tell us about what you think social media has done in shaping the public's perception about government and candidates? It's been a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that I think it has brought the populace to think about and get involved in what's going on in our society today. And to that end, I like it. I think a lot of people are pacifists and they sit back and social media like X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, and all the others have got people involved. Now, the downside is you can hide behind a keyboard and essentially say what you want without having to fear repercussions. And, you know, we live in a free society, so you should be able to say what you think. Mm -hmm. But there are consequences to what you say. So you may uh, spout off on some subject and maybe not be fully informed, and you just say what you want. And there's somebody on the other end that is seeing that, and perhaps they take it at face value, and they believe it, and then they run with it. And now we've got, it's like the telephone game. It, one person tells another and tells another and tells another, and now we've got this runaway falsehood that is just running rampant. It's like a fire that just catches a, on an ember and goes and goes. Right. The difference between reality and truth and what's purported as reality and truth has become immense. You know, in, in the current election cycle, I keep questioning in my own mind why small states like Vermont and Iowa, in terms of population, get to pick which candidates we get to choose from. Mm-hmm getting crazy. I don't like the system the way we've got it. Uh, the caucus system, the electoral college. If, I, if if Peter Bernard was king for a day, I'd throw it all out. Mm-hmm. I, I would make every primary in America on the same day at essentially the same time so that the people could pick which candidates were going to go on and be running for president or vice president. I like that. Mike, I'll take it one step further. I think the party system needs to go. Um, without stating my opinions on the way things are, um, I think it's not correct that I have to pick either being a Republican or a Democrat. I know you can be independent also, but um, there are things that the Republicans say and do that I that I, I raise my hand and say, right on, right on. There's things that the Democrats say and do that I go, you know what, I agree with you on that. Why can't I just be a little bit of both? I have to pick a side. I don't get it. Well, the deeper problem is that we, in Congress we don't, and the Senate, we don't have term limits. You know, yeah. We should have term limits for them, and we should have term limits for even the Supreme Court. Here, here. You know, whether it's 20 years or 25 years, mm-hmm. uh, that's long enough. I agree. I agree. Even the local people have term limits. You can't be a, a mayor in some towns for more than maybe one or two terms. The president can serve 
two four-year terms. That sounds pretty good, but in Congress, they don't. The reason is because they vote on, they vote themselves on what it's going to be. They have their own health care plan, mm-hmm. but not every American has a health care plan. And it's nowhere near as good as theirs. Oh, well, right. And it's lifetime. Mm-hmm. You serve one uh, term, and you've got care for life, health care for life. What a gig. What a gig. I don't know. We have to change the political system. Here, here. And put term limits on, and I think we need to allow the populace, the entire population of the country, pick which candidates are actually running. How about this as a concept, Mike? The person who gets the most vote votes wins, period. Who cares? Throw out the Electoral College. I understand when the, gut, when the uh, nation was young, there was concern about the larger states having too much of a say. Well, I think, how about just have a a, a vote nas- nationally and whoever gets, gets the most votes wins, period. Mm, that, that raises other questions so I, that I don't want to touch. But knowing at least one person who has served in the Oriel College. Electoral, yes. Electoral, <laughs> it seems like that's a fair way to represent the way each state voted. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, uh, let's let's move on to another question. What what was your favorite part about being a reporter of the news for over four decades? It's an easy question to answer. I loved when I would do a story and it would affect change in society. I would expose a bad guy. I would tell somebody about a person who's torching houses in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I loved being the guy on the top of the mountain saying, "Hey, folks, you need to watch out for this," mm-hmm. and people did, and then. It was great satisfaction when I helped law enforcement put someone in jail. Maybe I showed their mug and then somebody said, hey, that's John. He lives next door. I know that guy. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's a bad guy. There's a thing that goes around. It's called skimmers that they put on gas station pumps and they steal your your credit card. I did numerous stories on that. And I loved when I could say, hey, folks, give it a good shake. Give it a good once over. And maybe you'll get saved from getting your credit card skimmed. You know, it's a minor. It's a microcosm. I loved affecting change in society. If my story caused something new to happen or alerted something people to something going on, that was job satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Was the one thing that one story that you told that really had a emotional impact on you that sticks to today? It's hard for me to pin it down after forty years of broadcasting. You did a lot of stories. Sure. I did a lot, thousands, thousands of stories. Stories that hit me were those that affected kids mm-hmm. and and animals. Because normally they don't have a choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. A kid who was abused, um, I can't tell you how many stories I did about babies with broken bones and the parents were the ones that caused it. I get a tear now thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Little baby, uh, innocent, doesn't have any preconceptions of how the world's going to be and their parents are turning against them? Holy crap, what the... I don't get it. Stories about unnecessary gun violence. I got so numb to it, Mike, that when I was sent to stories about somebody shooting someone, Mm -hmm. I I could write it before I got there. But I had to really boil it down and not be so jaded and say to myself, you know what? This affected someone's life. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's in the hood or if it's in some rich society. Somebody just took someone's life because they got so mad that they grabbed a gun and shot them. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff got me. Animal stuff, animal abuse. Oh, don't even get me started. When I see on YouTube pictures of people abandoning a dog and there's a camera looking at wherever they did it and the dog's trying to run after the car, oh, that gets mm. me in the heart. Mm. So do you own a dog? I own two cats. I just got them three weeks ago. <laughs> Sumter County Animal Services. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. I was a dog guy until I realized that the dog owned me. <laughs> That's true often, isn't it? Well, you know, cats are so aloof. they pet You can pet them when they want you to pet them. Right, right, right. <laughs> the dog owned me and my wife and... When we finally, when he finally got ill, I said to her, you know, let's get another dog, because I liked it. And did you? No. Oh. She said, no more dogs. That's the end of it, huh? So that you're petless now. Yeah, yeah. That was Mr. Bear behind you. Uh, uh, okay, gotcha. Little, nice little dachshund. He was a, a, a great dog when I had him. We're going to take a break now and listen to Dr. Craig Curtis. Yeah. Dr. Curtis, can you talk about alcohol use? And Alzheimer's. Yes, Mike. They have had studies out for years that show those with that have one to two drinks a day actually have a lower risk of heart attack or stroke. And in a study published... Um, That's interesting. That means that people who totally abstain from alcohol have a higher risk? That's a, that's a difficult question, Mike. It's yes, those that abstain from alcohol, not with Alzheimer's disease, but actually had a slightly higher risk of heart attack and stroke. Mm-hmm. 
However, so this was a study published in June of 2023 in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and they showed for the first time that those that had one to two drinks per day, it was associated with lower risk of heart attack or stroke, and they found out it was because of long-term reductions in stress signaling in the brain. So essentially, they had less stress, which we've always known is a risk factor for a heart attack or stroke. But the American College of Cardiology currently is not advocating for the use of alcohol to reduce your risk of heart attack or strokes because of other concerning effects of alcohol on health. With over 20 years of experience studying brain health, Dr. Curtis's goal is to educate the village's community on how to live a longer, healthier life. To learn more, visit his website, craigcurtismd.com or call 352-500-5252 to attend a free seminar. Now, you're a, a tesla a holic. <laughs> I understand you own two Teslas. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't I, stop at one. <laughs> well, I bought my first one in 2019 while I was still working. Mm -hmm. And then when I retired, I was sitting on the couch too much. And so I applied for a part-time job at Tesla, and I got hired. Mm -hmm. So I was a Tesla advisor at International Plaza in Tampa, and I sold them down there. My job was to get, as they call it, butts in seats for TDs, mm -hmm. test drives. And I was also um, told that I was to uh, pre-qualify people, try and figure out if they just wanted to take a ride in a nice car or if they were a real buyer. Mm -hmm. We had a little secret way of doing that. If they didn't appear to me to be a real customer, I would say, we don't have any uh, test drive vehicles right now. I might have five down below in the garage, but right. I wasn't going to send them out in one. So I became a Tesla fan. I have a uh, Facebook group. It's called Tesla Software and Updates, if you will allow the plug. I have 76,000 members, and I'm the admin for it. I spend most of my time policing it for stupid posts and, mm -hmm. uh, and ads, which I do not allow. But uh, I go to the Tesla group meetings here in the villages. I'm a member of that. Uh, have adopted me as a part of their group very openly. Um, next session, they're going to have me on a panel of experts because I'm kind of a software expert on, on Tesla. I love it. I have a Model Y and a Model 3. I love both of them. The Model Y is a performance of so 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds. So if you have a need for speed, that's the way to go. I love it. So... When you take the car and you accelerate rapidly, mm -hmm. you burn your battery down faster. You do, but it's not really noticeable. I get 300 miles on a charge. If I lose three to five miles by being a jackrabbit, I don't care. It yeah. costs me 11 cents per kilowatt hour to recharge it, so it's not a big deal. Air conditioning takes a little bit, and jackrabbit starts take a little bit. The good news is when I lift my foot off the accelerator, notice I don't say gas pedal, it puts some of that power back in the battery sure. through kinetic energy. You're regenerating, or That's Mercedes right. talk, they call that recuperation. Right, we call it regenerative braking. Yes, it's a, it's a good feature. Yeah. A good feature. Oh, yeah. But I, I was thinking about taking the car out on a real track like Talladega, you know, with a 34-degree bank. And have you ever dri driven on a track with a 34-degree bank? No, and I never will because I don't trust my driving, and I'm not going to have to call the insurance company and say, I just wrecked my $66,000 car. Well, you you, have, you got a problem, you know, because you, 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 you put your car up on the track at Talladega. You're, you're not covered by insurance. Oh, well, there you go. There's an exclusion in your policy. I, I will not be doing that. I've done it many times. Really? And How fast did you get going? Uh, well, first thing, first big discovery was you can't enter a 34 degree bank at less than about 90 miles an hour because the track will throw you off back to the center. So, the, and the instructions on a track like that are very, real simple: accelerate, turn left, accelerate, turn left, mm -hmm. accelerate, turn left. Right, and the acceleration helps keep you grounded. Well, so, yeah, yeah. It, it, it allows you to go ride up the bank yeah. and uh, take advantage of the, the way the track is laid out. Uh, uh, the, but the fastest I've ever gone is 85, and I'm looking in my rearview mirror and I'm just paranoid. I don't want to get a ticket at that speed. That's oh, criminal yeah. speed. In today's newspaper, that and people will be able to figure out when we recorded this show. But yeah, I can say it's. Uh, what is it, the 20th, 20th of mm -hmm. February, 2024, yeah. the front page picture on the Daily Sun was a picture of a laser or radar police officer in Wildwood shooting people on Route 301. Yep. Uh, I've always felt that's a little bit uh, unfair because sometimes speed limits are set way below what the roads are capable of providing. And with the light traffic, sometimes it makes no sense to have a 45 mile an hour speed. Yeah, it seems artificially low. Going through Middleton these days, it's I think it's 35 out there. 
and there's hardly any houses there now. They're building, and they're going to be, but right now, 35. But I've seen the cops out there stopping people, mm-hmm. and you, you're poking along at 35, and you feel like a snail. All oh, right, right. And you go five over, and they're going to give you a citation. Well, I can tell you as a reporter, I've ridden around with cops a number of time and times, and unofficially, they'll give you 10. Yeah, unofficially. <laughs> uh, some will, some mm-hmm. won't. Depends on if they've had their coffee in the morning. Right, and, and, and if they have a so-called quota. To hit. I don't think you do. Uh, on that note, I think that attitude counts for a lot. If you're belligerent with them as they approach your car and you don't roll down your window and you're one of these soft sit baloney that you've probably seen on the internet, mm-hmm. if you're cooperative and, and apologize and are, are nice, you have a better chance of not getting that citation. Oh, that's good advice. Yeah. That's good advice. So you bought your first Tesla four years ago? 2019, yep. Okay. And why did you buy that first Tesla? I am a technology nut, and I like to follow what's going on with the latest technology. Speaking of nuts, Elon Musk can be at times, but I also consider him a genius. My car is essentially a computer with four wheels. Some people have described Tesla as being a computer company that happens to make cars. They also are a computer company that happens to make rocket ships that go up to the International Space Station and drill underneath Las Vegas for a a transportation system that they have there. I love technology. My whole house is decked out with voice-activated fans and lights. I can turn on my TV with my voice, so my car is an extension of it. Okay, and you have the latest beta software in your cars? (laughs) Well, it's all beta software. The full self-driving is definitely a beta program, and they tell you that when you download it. I do not have full self-driving in my car. That's a $12,000 option. I didn't think it was worth it. I have the auto steer, autopilot that I have in my car, Mm -hmm. and I use it a lot, especially on I-75 when I visit um, friends down in Pinellas County. It takes a lot of the fatigue out of driving. You have to babysit it. You have to keep your hand on the wheel at all times. But I love the fact that if something crazy happens, and my computer will react faster than I can, Mm -hmm. and I've seen it happen time and time again. Somebody does something stupid ahead of you, or they slow, or they break, and you're not paying attention, it will do it for you, and even make evasive maneuvers. It's not 100%. There's been a lot of crashes. There's a website or YouTube page called Wham Bam Tesla Cam, and you can see the results of some of that. But um, I I love the fact that it might save my life someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm a mercedes alcoholic, and I've always liked, and it's over 40 years, I think I bought my first one in 79. Mm Mm-hmm. That they, their design philosophy is the car is sacrificial to the human beings inside of it. And they build a car like that. Mm-hmm. It might mean it's going to be more expensive to repair because more parts are going to be broken. Yeah. Sounds like Volvo. They do the same thing. Yeah. Volvo does a very similar thing. Results uh, speak for themselves. I've seen several, many Mercedes drivers that were in serious accidents. And they walked away. Scot-free, not a... Yeah. And, you know, over the years, my car has been hit several times, and I never got really mm-hmm. terribly injured. Yeah. Well, Tesla has a, what they call five-star crash rating from NHTSA. And um, I, when I used to sell them, I would bring that up because they'd say, well, what about, what about? And they've got a zillion and one reasons why not to buy the car. And I'd say, well, if you ever get in a wreck, the odds are you're going to walk away. Yeah. Well, a high safety rating is important. Yep. But the design philosophy behind the safety rating, uh, the crumple zones and the Mercedes have always made a, a big difference. The fact that uh, when they had gas, have gasoline engines, the engine is designed to slide underneath the passenger compartment. Mm-hmm. That makes all the sense in the world. Yep. I think we're going to take a break now and we'll be back next week with the remainder of the interview with Peter Bernard. Remember, our next episode will be released next Friday at 9 a.m. Should you want to become a major supporter of the show or have questions, please contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. This is a shout out for supporters, Tweet Coleman, Ed Williams, and major supporter Dr. Craig Curtis at K2 in the Villages. We will be hearing more from Dr. Curtis with short Alzheimer's tips each week. If you know someone who should be on the show, contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. We thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyrighted by Rothvoice 2024. All rights reserved.